So our, our second speaker of the morning is going to be Nathan Ellis, and he's also one of our ophthalmic pathology research fellows. And Nathan's going to be talking a little bit about an issue that we don't like to hear about, but it's important that we know about toxic anterior segment syndrome, or TAS, and specifically the role of preservatives and stabilizing agents in some of the fluids that we use in terms of causing TAS. So, Nathan. Thank you, Dr. Mamelis. Um, like Dr. Mamelis said, my name is Nathan Ellis, and I will be talking about toxic anterior segment syndrome associated with preservatives and stabilizing agents. I have no financial interest or with the material presented this morning as well. Here's a little bit about our lab. This is Dr. Mamelis, who you just saw, and Dr. Lilian Warner, and some of the research that they work with. So toxic anterior segment syndrome or TAS as coined by our very own Dr. Mamelis, is most commonly seen after cataract surgery. However, it can be after any type of anterior segment surgery, whether it be cornea or glaucoma or any of these. It is an acute inflammatory process seen within 12 to, 20, 12 to 48 hours postoperatively, although on occasion, rarely it can see, be seen farther postoperatively, but most often within a two-day time period. It is, as the it is, as the name suggests, limited to the anterior segment of the eye, although also on occasion, very rarely, you can have some mild vitreous involvement. However, this is mild and very small. It is always gram stain negative as well as cultural negative. And you can have associated symptoms such as corneal edema that can be diffuse and as Dr. Olson coined, limbus to limbus, as well as fibrin formation resulting in hypopions, dilated irregular pupils, an early decrease in intraocular pressure with possibility of a secondary glaucoma later. This is a great example of the cornea after a, a severe case of TAS. You can tell that the corneal edema is limbus to limbus as well because of the widespread endothelial damage. This endothelial damage is due to the market anterior segment inflammation. This inflammation can result in this hypopion that you see at the very bottom right there, as well <coughs> as um, fibrin formation in this, this, uh, this, yeah, excuse me, this, um, inter this anterior segment inflammation can result in fibrin formation. This fibrin formation is then going, can adhere to the pupil, the, the uh, trabecular meshwork, and the implanted intraocular lens. When the inflammation and the fibrin will adhere to the iris, it can cause dilated irregular pupils, which you see here, as well as clogging the trabecular meshwork and causing secondary glaucoma later. However, it's important to distinguish that TAS, or toxic anterior segment syndrome, is not endophthalmitis. Therefore, we must rule out an infectious etiology. Like I mentioned earlier, TAS is gram stain negative, as well as cultural negative, whereas endophthalmitis is often not. Endophthalmitis has a later onset of four to seven days, although now we're thinking that it may be as late as two weeks postoperatively, or as, like I mentioned earlier, TAS is within 24 hours, 24 hours to 48 hours postoperatively. Endophthalmitis has a prominent vitreous involvement, whereas TAS is mostly anterior segment, and endophthalmitis is more often associated with pain, as well as lid swelling, conjunctival chemosis and discharge, and diffuse ocular injection, as you can see here. Dr. Edelhauser wrote this paper in 1982. He was kind of the founder of the TAS uh, Suggestion Committee, which is now known as the TAS Task Force. And he wrote this paper that described and a bunch of factors that could decrease the pump function of the corneal endothelium. And I've listed a few of them here that we relate highly with TAS. Solutions that are injected into the anterior chamber that are outside of the pH range of 6.8 to 8.2 and preserved in the excuse me, preservatives in the medication that we inject, including sodium bisulfate, thimerosal, benzalkonium chloride, and others, and solutions outside of the osmolality of 200 to 400 milliosmoles. So this task task force that I mentioned earlier, if a surgery center is unfortunate enough to have an outbreak of TAS, they can go onto the ASCRS website and fill out this task questionnaire regarding their surgical techniques and their cleaning and sterilization techniques. And then this goes to Dr. Mamlis, who then can make recommendations 
and hopefully prevent TAS in the future at their surgery center. Over the years, this has provided quite a bit of data um, where we've been able to write papers and analyze and see trends in TAS. In 2010, the first paper came out that examined 77 questionnaires and we were able to determine some of the most common causes of TAS. This being inadequate flushing of FACO and IA hand pieces, the use of enzymatic cleaners, detergents at the wrong concentration, and preserved epinephrine. In 2012, they wrote another, we wrote another paper, and this was kind of to determine where we had come and where we were going with TAS. We took the questionnaires from 2009 to 2012 and analyzed them to prior questionnaires. Overall, this was 130 questionnaires that evaluated over 69,000 surgeries and for over 1,400 cases of TAS. We were able to determine that we were improving on some areas and regressing in some other areas as well. For example, there was a 26% reduction in the um, in sites reporting that they were flushing adequately as well or inadequately, as well as an increase in by 27% in sites that were using deionized distilled water for their flushes as opposed to tap water. There's also an, in, an improvement in the use of preserved epinephrine, but however, we degressed in areas such as handling of instruments and IOLs with our gloves, as well as poor instrument maintenance. So because of these papers, we know there are many known causes of TAS, and one of the most common causes of TAS is ophthalmic instrument contamination. This can be done through a variety of different mechanisms and a variety of different contaminants. One of the most common ones is detergent residues. This can be from either the soaps that we use, the enzy enzymatic cleaners, or the ultrasonic baths, which can harbor gram-negative bacteria. This can also be due to bacterial lipopolysaccharides and other endotoxins found in these gram-negative bacteria, which can be in tap water, as well as these ultrasonic baths that I mentioned. We don't see metal ion residues so often, but earlier and in, in recent, in farther back years, we would see copper and iron in the, in the metal pipes within the hospitals, and this could cause TAS as well, as, we, as well as denatured ophthalmic viscosurgical devices, or OVD. So because this is such a large problem and large cause of TAS, Dr. Mamlis and the TAS Task Force makes recommendations on how to clean your instruments and prevent TAS this way. And first off, we recommend that you flush your FACO and IA hand pieces as quickly as possible after surgery. This will not allow the OVD and the cortical material to dry. Once this material dries, it is very difficult to remove and becomes a primary cause of TAS. We also recommend flushing with 120 cc's of sterile deionized water. While this may cause your arm to go into tetany flushing the IA ports, it is, ensures that the hand pieces will be free of this cortical material and OVD. And we would recommend flushing at least the final push with sterile deionized distilled water. We don't want any ions in the hand pieces once we go, they go into autoclave because these hand pieces will retain the ions that can cause TAS. And also, if we flush with tap water, tap water is known to contain small amounts of gram-negative bacteria, which, yes, are killed in the autoclave, However, the lipopolysaccharides and the endotoxins in the cell wall are not, and thus can cause TAS. And we recommend against the use of detergents and ultrasonic baths. Ultrasonic baths, if not cleaned properly, can harbor gram-negative bacteria and once again cause TAS. And detergents have these en enzymes in it that cl help clean. However, these enzymes are active and are inactivated at temperatures of 140 degrees Celsius or higher. That's all well and good until you determine, until we remember that autoclaves only reach a temperature of about 130 degrees Celsius. Thus, these enzymes are still active and still able to cause TAS. And once again, we recommend flushing with sterile deionized distilled water. And I already mentioned these gram-negative bacteria found in tap water as well as in ultrasonic baths, if not cleaned properly, can cause TAS because of the lipopolysaccharides. I mentioned these, the metal deposits found in the piping of old hospitals, as well as uh, reusable canyons and IA tips are often where we find that OB, retained OVD and cortical material is retained, and um, thus we recommend flushing very often and frequently 
to prevent that. Another primary known cause of TAS is ocular medication. This can be caused uh, through multiple different reasonings. Incorrect drug concentration is one of them. Incorrect osmolality, which I mentioned earlier, if it is outside of the 200 to 400 milliosmoles, it can cause uh, damage to the corneal endothelium as well as the incorrect pH. If it's outside of the 6.5 to 8.5 range, it can be uh, toxic to the corneal endothelium. And preservatives and medication solutions. One of the pr first preservatives um, known to cause TAS was benzalkonium chloride. Benzalkonium chloride has been used in our topical drops for quite some time now. However, there has been inadvertent use into the interocular and, and interior chambers. This top paper mentioned a case where it was injected into the anterior chamber. And the bottom paper mentions a case where benzalkonium chloride was actually used as a preservative in OVD. However, that did not last long because both these cases resulted in very uh, raging, raging cases of TAS and very poor vision uh, for the, the patients. So now I'd like to talk about a, different, a couple different outbreaks that we've seen recently. For outbreak number one, which, which was at a surgery center in Virginia, um, we saw this a couple months ago, actually. There was 276 cases uh, of phaco emulsification and IOL implantation surgeries performed over a two-month period. This was performed by five different surgeons and 14 cases of TAS presented during this time period. Luckily, they were, the cases were mild and 13 recovered to 20-20 vision, the best corrective visual acuity two weeks postoperatively. The second outbreak is very similar to the first. This was performed at a surgery center in Alaska, and there are five cataract surgeries performed by one surgeon on a single day. These five cases, sure enough, the next day resulted in five cases of TAS and were treated with the standard postoperative treatment. And luckily, once again, all these patients recovered 2020 best corrective visual acuity two weeks postoperatively. We were able to look at the TAS questionnaire that they both sent in. We were able to examine the similarities and differences between the two sites and realized that they had both used a medication that <coughs> they had just recently ordered, which was the epinephrine that they injected into the anterior chamber. This epinephrine was made by Par Pharmaceuticals, who, unfortunately for them, decided to change the formulation. Um, so they, in earlier this year, they changed the formation, formulation, adding tartaric acid, which is a known preservative. They did come out with this um, release earlier that year but through the FDA, which said that this epinephrine has tartaric acid and is no longer uh, approved for ophthalmic use. However, these surgical centers were not notified. The NDC number, which is the National Drug Code, which at any time a formulation is approved, it has to go through the National Drug Code, was uh, not changed, and thus the surgery centers were left unaware and able to order the same epinephrine that they always had, and unfortunately able to use it and cause cases of TAS. This is the uh, molecular formula of the tartaric acid. We don't know a whole lot about this uh, formulation, but we are pretty sure that it, could it did cause the TAS. Um, and thus, it's a very um, dire consequence for these patients just because of the formulation that everyone was unaware. Outbreak number three happened a couple years ago. This was performed at a surgery center in Iowa. There was 12 cataract surgeries performed by one surgeon on a single day, and these 12 cases resulted in tests the next day postoperatively. Um, we were able to also analyze the questionnaire and realized that the pharmacist trying to do his job and save money and help out had substituted moxaza for Vigamox. They are both formulations of moxifloxacin. However, moxaza is, has preservatives, whereas Vigamox does not. These preservatives, preservatives are xanthan gum, sorbitol, and tiloxapol, which unfortunately tiloxapol is a mucolytic as well as a detergent. Also worth note that Vigamox has recently come off patent, unfortunately, and because of that, there's gonna be lots of generics coming out, so we may have to be on the aware that there may be preservatives put in these generics as well, and, and hopefully we don't see that in the future. Fortunately, though, Dr. Mouse was able to put out a press release 
a warning about moxaza and the preservatives of tiloxapol in moxaza and how it is toxic to the corneal endothelium, and thus we have not seen any TAS cases due to moxaza since then. Our fourth and final outbreak was due to an intracameral injection of vancomycin. This also was three or four years ago. The compounding pharmacy performed the incorrect dilution of vancomycin. Um, the vancomycin dilution was 100 fold, 100 times too concentrated, and because of this, the pH, which is vancomycin, is fairly acidic, was a 4, which is outside of our pH range um, of healthy for healthy corneal endothelium. Also, the dilution was performed with sterile water instead of a balanced salt solution, therefore, it was outside of the osmolality range as well. Unfortunately, these um, these patients resulted in severe corneal edema, secondary glaucoma, and count finger visibility. So once the offending agent has been injected into the anterior chamber, what do we do? Well, you want to su suppress the secondary inflammatory response as quickly as possible using topical corticosteroids. Normally we recommend 1% prednisone acetate every one to two hours, and a couple surgeons are finding topical NSAIDs helpful as well. And we also recommend careful follow-up for the first few days to make sure that the inflammation is going down. However, secondary prevention is not quite as good as primary prevention uh, or primary treatment, and we hope that we can uh, inform the ophthalmology population um, that, with, that with education the entire, uh, the entire surgical team, of the entire surgical team, of surgical nurses, operating room technicians, residents, physicians, and pharmacists that we will be able to prevent TAS. A lot of these cases are preventable, and because of that, we think that in the long run with education, we can improve and hopefully prevent TAS in the future. That is my talk. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Comment. This is a real cautionary tale because we as surgeons need to know what's going into the patient's eye and we often don't. We assume that what is being placed is, is what we want it to be, but we don't know. And what was really scary about this epinephrine is that the company changed the formulation in January, didn't change the number, didn't tell anybody. This release they put out, although it's backdated, didn't really get out to ophthalmologist until July when we started getting reports of, of people having this unexplained inflammation and they changed the formulation and they wrote on there not for ophthalmic use. <laughs> and, but again, didn't tell anybody. And so as people went through their stock of epinephrine where you, know, you use it for several months, nothing was happening, and then they switched to the new one and then they would get an outbreak of TAS right away. And so, of course, we're sending out alerts and, and working with companies now. And um, one of the things that the task force is working on now is, is you know, we're approaching the company saying, you know, eyes are not blood vessels, and, and eyes, you know, react differently to, to uh, preservatives and to stabilizing agents, and so you need to make a preservative-free, stabilizer-free epinephrine, but the second thing that we tell them is there are three million cataracts done in the United States every year, and virtually all of them use epinephrine, either in the bottle or intracamerally, so it's a huge potential market, so I'm still puzzled as to why companies haven't seen this and jumped on it, and so, at the moment, you know, you're having to go through obscure sources to get this epinephrine instead of the main companies. And the other main company that used to make this was bought by a second company who then said, well, if we don't put stabilizing agents in here, their shelf life isn't long enough, so we're going to change them. And again, with no thought to the fact that inside the eye, which is their main market, an adding of a stabilizing agent or a preservative is potentially going to cause toxicity. And so we need, as a society, to educate not only ourselves and, and nurses and people who are ordering medications, but also the companies themselves. I felt really bad for the surgeon who had the outbreak of vancomycin. A pharmacist in their center said, hey, we're going to save money. Look, moxaza, this has moxifloxacin in it. We'll use that. Didn't tell anybody. And so, of course, they substituted it, and, uh, and you know, the patients all had raging inflammation because there was preservative agents in there. And so anything you put into an eye, has to be preservative-free, stabilizer-free, so it's very important that you realize what's going into the eye. And the problem is we often don't know. We assume, and we're handed a, you know, a syringe, but we need to kind of step back and say, okay, what are we using now? Yeah, so um, 
there's actually more than one like question was. Oh, I was asked, I was gonna ask what the history is at our center in the past or at the VA. Do we have I, I like vaguely remember one case that we thought was yeah, the VA there's been a rare sporadic case, but fortunately we've been lucky we have not had a major outbreak here. And so we spent a lot of time working with the nurses here and, and it's interesting, the other thing we're fighting now is the use of enzymes. And so CMS and some of the regulatory agencies have decided that because people in California had out infections from colonoscopies that weren't properly enzymed, therefore all instruments and all surgeries should be treated with enzymes. And so again, we've been fighting that fight with the FDA and with CMS and with regulatory agencies to say no, enzymes on ocular instruments are toxic. Even they're not colonoscopy, they're in the eye and they're toxic. And so here at this hospital, the U was going to make us use enzymes. And so we had to fight them tooth and nail and prevent, present data and do everything to get them to say, no, we don't have to do that. But again, it's, it's something that a random surgical center will have and, and you know, someone will come in and, and inspect them and then cite them and say, you have to do this or we'll shut you down. And so we've been fighting this all the way through. And so we're to the point now where we're having to change manufacturers' recommendations from each manufacturer so that they don't require enzymes for ocular instruments. And so it's, it's just the law of unintended consequences. And so we're, the problem is we all have to be vigilant. And so fortunately here we've got a good group. They're aware of what's going on and everybody's aware of that. I've been spending time talking to the pharmacy and they have a stable source of preservative-free, stabilizer-free epinephrine. The Bigamox is coming off patent, and so now there's generic moxifloxacins available. And so again, they're being very careful to get the preservative-free moxifloxacin even in the generic, so that we can still use that safely for those who use that intracamerally. I'm, actually, I'm surprised that these aren't toxic to endothelial cells and blood vessels. With how well, but there's a, but the because eye. they're diluted in you know six liters of blood. I mean, the, the effect is. It's not that big. Where you're talking in the anterior chamber, we're talking 0.3, okay. you know, milliliters there, and so it's very concentrated as opposed to throughout the entire yeah. blood system. They, and it's they are. Two hours. I mean, you know, the yeah. protocol for some you know, yeah. antibiotic infusions, for instance, for um, finagulin, it was this one that's particularly toxic. Um, you know, IV administration, the you know, flush first, flush after, flush during. Um, and, or you can't put it in a peripheral IV, you have to put it in a central IV. Oh, I mean, this, okay. this is an issue for, that. That makes sense. but I think that, I think that it's, a, it's a much easier battle than in the eye, because you can't flush. Yeah. Great. All right, thank you.